you will see on the title page a uh, link called goillinois.edu. Uh, you can reference our past webinars uh, by clicking on that, and we'll talk more about that. If this is the first time you've joined us for the webinars, we uh, welcome you. And uh, it's kind of an impromptu type of thing we like to do. We jump around a little bit with our information. And if any time throughout this you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to type them in. Uh, we'll stop what we're doing. We'll talk about it. I'll read the question. We'll get you the best answer we can. If I cannot answer the question, uh, then I will make notice to who's answered that and uh, or who's asked it, and then we will get back with you in touch and get you the answer that you're looking for. I'd like to thank my engineer, Brian Kirshner. Like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about winterizing not only the gauge, but we did this one previous time about a year ago when we talked about winterization and kind of specify just the gauges. And today I want to elaborate a little bit more and talk about the collectors a little bit and, and some other components that, you know, take just as much of punishment from old man winter as, uh, as, uh, the, uh, gauges themselves do. So, uh, like I said, if you have any questions throughout, uh, let me know. Brian, we'll go to the first slide if we could. There's three types of gauges used within the network, the Belfort, the NOAA 4, and the Pluvio 2, uh, the top one being the, the manual gauge, the bottom two, the NOAA 4, and the Pluvio 2 are the electronic gauges. I'd like to start out with the uh, Belfort winterization. The components for the Belfort, uh, the outside shell, uh, basically you have to undo about three screws near the bottom of that. When you're winterizing the Belfort gauge, uh, the primary thing, the funnel, which you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, all you have to do is twist the top, slide it off, remove the funnel. But before you do that, make sure that you remove the pins from the Belfort chart because any stirring around or bumping of the outer shell of this particular gauge uh, can show some uh, uh, marks on the chart that are, you know, not equivalent to uh, precipitation. Uh, so you remove that shell. We'll move on to our next slide. We we'll want to go. We we'll want to go back to go into the Belfort winterization part of it. There we go. That's what it looks like when you take the shell off. One of the primary things to remember when you're doing this, uh, whether you're using the manual gauge like the Belfort or the electronic gauges is fresh antifreeze. Uh, with the open orifice, in order for the precipitation that occurs, you have to keep the, an antifreeze in there. Uh, we recommend doing a 60-40, 60% antifreeze, 40% water. As more precipitation falls, then obviously this will get diluted a little bit. Uh, so try to keep something handy so that you can stir the uh, antifreeze on a weekly basis. We'll elaborate that a little bit further. Uh, for winterization purposes, after a long winter, you get a lot of wasps, you get bees, you get ants, you get everything possible that can get in one of these gauges. And if we can jump ahead a little bit uh, to a slide, actually we'll do it in a minute and I'll show everybody what, what I'm uh, specifically talking about. One thing for keeping the gauge uh, clean is investing in something called CRC uh, gum out. And basically with a gum out, it is a non-residue type of a spray and you can spray it on any of the linkages inside of the Belfort gauge. Now, you don't want to spray it on anything in the electronic gauges, but for the manual gauge, the Belfort, uh, anything is fair game for spraying uh, ex with the exception of the pin nibs. Uh, you don't want to spray that or the clock itself. Uh, what this does is you might get a small brush and as you're spraying all the armitages of the inside of the gauge itself, then as you spray it, then you can kind of brush away any dirt debris that may be, uh, uh, you know, that way you minimize the problems that can occur when the snow falls and whatever the, uh, the precipitation may be. Uh, another thing to make sure of, if you have a Belfort clock, uh, it's a good time to change the battery. Uh, some of the ba battery clocks are C-cell. Most of them are D-cell. You can buy a D-cell battery at any 
about any store or any uh that you go so uh, i would pick up and have an extra one of those on hand um, like i said though all you have to do basically for the belfort is to remove the funnel and make sure that you have fresh antifreeze in your bucket a good way when you put your chart back on to determine how much antifreeze the recommendation for the belfort as far as the amount of antifreeze to put in is to put in two inches how do i know when two inches of antifreeze good way to do this is to take and put a fresh chart on and then set your pins at uh, the half inch level on the chart and then pour your antifreeze in pre-mix your antifreeze with the 60 40 solution 60 percent antifreeze 40 water and stir that up and then pour it in once you've gotten to the two point there it's come up two inches on your belfort chart then you know that you put in the correct amount of antifreeze uh, something else to remember is not necessary to change the antifreeze out every week, but it's nice if you keep a stick uh, or a spoon is what we use to stir the uh, the contents of the antifreeze. Why do we want to do this is because antifreeze is actually heavier than water, and what it's, it'll do is called stratification, where the antifreeze will actually sink and the water will settle on top. So when it settles on top, the water... Uh, with the cold temperatures, it'll freeze, and any sort of precipitation you'll get will not melt with the good consistency of the antifreeze. It'll lay on top of that frozen water, and, you know, if you get any high winds, then it blows out, and it's a very inaccurate catch by the gauge. Are there any questions thus far? Something else to make sure of is when you set both pins on your Belfort chart, Make sure that as the bottom pin, which is the precip pin, uh, gets a little closer to the top pin, which is the event pin, that you don't let the two uh, interact or get connected with each other. Uh, it should be offset enough, but with the type of precipitation, sometimes uh, if you get too much, the pins can get tangled up, and you want to minimize uh, you know, any problems with that. So keep your antifreeze fresh uh, and dump it when you, it's necessary. Any questions? before we move on to our next gauge. Let's start with the, let's go to the NOAA 4. Our next gauge that we're going to look at is the NOAA 4 gauge. That's the electronic gauge. Basically, there's not a whole lot you have to do with this particular gauge. Just to make sure that your bucket's in there straight and that you have the bucket on the load cell uh, correctly and sitting nice and flat on the load cell itself. If it's off center ever so slightly, it's going to lean, give you inaccurate types of measurements. One thing to remember with the NOAA 4, and once again, you're using the 60-40 ratio, 60% antifreeze and 40% water in a premix. And Brian, let's go to the, the one diagram. You take an Allen wrench, remove the top of the gauge, and one thing I want to point out There's a picture of the inside of the NOAA 4 gauge. What happens is if you do not keep fresh antifreeze in this particular bucket container, what can happen is uh, if you see the red arrow, it's pointed near the bottom of the bucket. This is uh, has a silicone type of a seal, and what happens is if the antifreeze becomes, uh, you don't have any antifreeze in there or you get precip in there, and it's, uh, it freezes. What it does is it swells up the bucket and it blows out the seal in the bottom of this particular catch bucket. Had it happen on numerous occasions. The real threat and the thing that we worry about most is the fact that anything that's in that particular, the bottom of that gauge, leaking onto the electronic components in that gauge. This is a, a gauge that runs a pretty penny and, uh, you know, uh, better safe than sorry. Freeze fresh. As far as uh, when to dump it, uh, if you think it's stratifying at all, or if you've got more precipitation in there, uh, then you can use your pump uh, for pumping out the antifreeze into a into a discard bucket and uh, disposing correctly. Are there any questions about the NOAA four? Move on to the Pluvio two winterization. 
We can go to that one. That's fine. If you look at this picture, what's wrong with the dummy that's pouring the antifreeze into this particular uh, bucket? His mother obviously did not teach him a lick when he was younger. He's wearing a sweat, hooded sweatshirt, pouring antifreeze into a pluvio gauge and wearing a pair of shorts. And that particular dummy in the picture that I'm speaking about is me. So uh, the legs don't get cold, but the upper body sure does. So uh, take a precaution when going out to the site and uh, pretend that you're going to stay a while. But for the pluvio gauge, what's real, real important about the pluvio gauge is it is a bigger orifice. Uh, the bottom part is a little bit more antifreeze. What you want to really make sure when pouring antifreeze into the pluvio itself is to add enough to where it comes up past the point in the middle of the catch bucket. You'll see that it undulates up to a point right in the center. You want to make sure that you've got enough solution in there that it covers that point. Uh, that way, if any precipitation does fall, that you've got enough antifreeze in there that you're uh, able to cover the bottom completely. We have a question, where do you, we get a pump, a transfer pump? Um, if you do not have a transfer pump, uh, just let me know and, uh, and I see who particularly asked this question and we can send you one out. Uh, basically all you have to do is stick one end of the hose into the, into the, uh, antifreeze itself and you can pump it out. You can use this during the summertime as well. So uh, if you do not have a transfer pump, it makes things a lot easier. That way you don't have to lift these buckets or take the gauges apart when doing so. When you do empty your antifreeze or refresh your antifreeze at any point, make sure that you make note on the bottom of your field observer report form that you've emptied it because what we'll notice is specifically on the electronic gauge is a loss of precipitation level. Normally as, as precip occurs, uh, you see that the level goes up. If it drastically falls, we know that you probably did something uh, in refreshing the antifreeze, but it's nice to get a note from the operators as well. Any questions? We basically covered the antifreeze. I want to go back to the Belfort one more time if I could. Uh, attached to this particular webinar, is a cleaning memo for the Belford. I talked about a little bit about spring linkages and stuff like that. Uh, if you were to remove the bucket and you want to take apart the gauge to do a little uh, summerization, winterization type cleaning on a biannual basis, uh, this is a uh, way to go about it. And I wanted to just scroll through the pages of this real quick if we could. I made mention about spraying the linkages and stuff like that. In photo number five in the lower right-hand corner, if you see the back of the gauge, you can spray all that with the carburetor uh, cleaner and take that little brush and brush any dust or dirt, grease, grime, or cobwebs that have incurred that could impede the gauge from making an accurate type of uh, a reading. Uh, you know, anytime you use aerosols, you see to the left, uh, safety goggles. Uh, anytime you use an aerosol type of a spray, it's a good idea to have some sort of eyewear on, especially when it comes out of a can uh, at a high pressure point. So uh, you don't want to splash in that in your eyes. So once again, we preach safety and uh, take a pair of goggles if you know you're going to do this kind of uh, maintenance. And there, once again, the two uh, on these photos, photo six and photo seven, is just another area where we would like you to spray the, the gum out, carburetor cleaner, and... Uh, areas that can build up grease and grime. Do not, under any circumstances, ever use WD-40. Why? WD-40 works great for squeaks and stuff like that, but WD-40 has the has type of makeup uh, where it's going to attract dirt, grease, and grime and leave a residue where the gum out does not leave any residue. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. We've talked about the, the gauges. Now we're going to talk a little bit about something I want people to kind of take and do a little bit more site maintenance uh, on the collectors themselves. We have two different types of collectors in the network, and let's go to that slide. Uh, 
if we could. Our two different types of collectors are the Aerochem collector and the Encon collector. At this day and age, we have about 165 sites that have the Aerochem collector and about 85 that have the Encon collector. For the maintenance for these particular collectors uh, going into the winter time, uh, I'm going to have Brian scroll forward just a moment. I want to show what I'm talking about specifically. There we go. There's the man's best friend when you're a field site operator. Uh, and you want to stop the squeaks and and all the hang-ups and stuff like that, purchase yourself a can of this. It's a heavy-duty silicone, lubricates the gears and stuff like that on the underneath side of the Aerochem collector itself. You have a lot of linkages and stuff underneath there that if you spray a good coat of this uh, silicone on before winter, uh, basically the snow will not adhere to the, to the uh, mechanical points of the collector itself and be able to move just a little bit more freely. Uh, so give it a good spray on the underneath. And also, when you've removed the buckets from the two-bucket collector, feel free to spray the linkages on the arms to where they can move back and forth. What happens a lot of times, and go ahead and go back, is on the arrow cam, when you see where the, the arms that move the collector lid back and forth, uh, the screw points down below. If you spray a little silicone spray in there, then the ice will not as adhere to the entry uh, and exit chimes are adhere off. to the uh, collector as well, and it can move a little bit more freely when you get the frozen precipitation. The Encon collector, on the other hand, uh, the only places to really spray are the pivot points as well. When doing this, regardless of on the AeroCam or the Encon collector, make sure that the bucket is removed and that there's no buckets on there. Once again, uh, spraying a, an aerosol type of spray, uh, you want it to get to the point where you want it and not blow from the uh, from the wind. So we don't like to have any buckets on the collectors at that point. Any questions? Okay, let's move forward a little bit to our sensors. The C sensor for the in con, uh, basically three checks. What you want to do is make sure that your connector on the underneath side of your uh, these sensor is connected and nice and tight. Uh, check your mounting brackets. You get some heavy winds during winter as well as summer. Uh, just something that you want to check. And also make a habit on a weekly basis as to, depending upon the dryness or the moisture content of the snow, a lot of times in the U-shape of the T sensor, to activate the collector, the precipitation goes between the uh, in the U-shape there and activates the optical sensor. Well, if you've got particular snow, some of it may adhere uh, with the cold, adhere to the top of the sensor. So let's make sure on a weekly basis when we go out to the site that once we've taken the bucket off of the collector uh, before putting the new bucket on that we take a, a cloth and uh, wipe off any uh, ice or anything that it may have developed on the sensor that would potentially impede uh, precipitation going through the uh, optical sensor points of this sensor. Any questions? Winterization of the AeroChem grid sensor. The one on the left is the old type of sensor used, the 11 grid sensor used for MDN, and the one on the right is for the is the AeroChem sensor used in the NTN part of this, uh, the MDN being Mercury Deposition and the NTN being National Trends Network. Uh, the winterization for this is not much different than you would do on a weekly basis. If you see anything, uh, ice buildup, uh, grease, grime, dirt, bird dung, anything like that, you want to make sure to keep your sensor plates nice and clean. Uh, we don't want you spraying any sort of lubricant or anything like that on the sensor grid. But uh, on a weekly basis, make sure uh, take a brush, some deionized water. If you don't have deionized water and you notice that uh, that you've got some uh, dirt or some bird dung on it, grab a handful of snow. Once your bucket is out of the collector, uh, let it sit on the sensor grid and clean off any uh, contaminants that may be on the sensor grid. A handful of dry snow is also a really good way to test whether the sensor is working. If you're curious as to whether your sensor is heating up like it should, 
Uh, sprinkle a little snow on the grid, and you should be able to sit there and watch it melt. Uh, if you set, you know, just a handful, that will entail a call back to me, and we'll see about replacing that particular component. Any questions? Throwing a lot of information at you, but you're a veteran bunch, so don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions. Battery load testing. Uh, if you're running with a backup battery, whatever your power source may be, and we do have some uh, sites in the network, as Brian goes to that particular slide, one thing to remember when paralleling batteries in the power uh, sequence for whether you're a battery-only site or whether you're a solar site, or even if you're running an aero or a AC site with a battery backup, is making sure twice a year that you have your battery load tested. Not many people keep around a load test, but it's very easy to remove this battery, although it's heavy, take it to your little part, local parts store, whether it be a Walmart, whether it be an AutoZone, O'Reilly's, whatever it may be, and have them load tested. They'll do it for free. It's real important. The thing to remember when running a battery, just one battery alone, is it will not have the capabilities with the new Incon collector be able to run this system with just one battery. What you'll see in the operation of this collector is to run a couple batteries, two, three, four of them in parallel so that you know you have enough battery capacity to run it. Uh, what happens with this particular type of uh, powering scenario is your system is only going to be as good as your worst battery. So if you've got three brand new batteries and you instill one bad battery in that system, the system is going to act based upon the bad battery. So it's a good idea to have these load tested before winter or especially after winter. Uh, if you have any problems, uh, always make sure, you know, in, in winterization to keep your solar panels as free of snow as you can. Uh, the little battery to the right is the battery that you will see in the NOAA 4 and the Pluvio gauge, uh, I'd tell you to do something with that, but basically if it's working, uh, let's not mess with it. If it's not working, we'll notice it uh, quickly because of the uh, loss of data on your electronic gauge. We will uh, alert you that that's not working, so that's not a big one to worry about. I need to go out and buy batteries. Where's the best place to do it, and what kind of batteries should I buy? Highly recommend Deep Cycle Marine Batteries from Walmart. They're about $90 a piece. Uh, they have, uh, buy at least, I recommend, better than 650 cold cranking amp batteries. Uh, and the marine batteries themselves are normally 850 cold cranking amps. You buy one, it's a good one. Uh, you'll alleviate having any sort of problems uh, powering the collector. If it gets really cold, I mean, Old Man Winter is going to take its uh, toll on even new or old stuff. Uh, sometimes we just can't do anything about it, but it's nice to have the uh, equipment updated and to try to alleviate as many problems as we can before it occurs. Are there any questions? And there, there again, uh, we have an in-house load tester. Basically, what you do is what they'll do at an auto parts store is they'll They'll put a load on it like it's, uh, you know, something operating against it. If the battery is good, it'll show in the green. If it's bad, it'll show in the red. Uh, per purchase a new one if you have to. Any questions? Go ahead. Types of antifreeze. Now, there's a whole bunch of them out there. You can buy about any kind of antifreeze you want. We recommend the ethylene glycol, and we'll go to the next page real quick. Not that one. <laughs> there. Eth uh, the characteristic <laughs> characteristics of ethylene glycol and poly or the propylene glycol, uh, the freezing point. We recommend the ethylene glycol because for a couple of different re reasons, uh, but the one of the top reasons is uh, it has a lower level of, uh, uh, the freezing point is higher 
and it's not as toxic. So, I mean, it's easier to dispose of. Uh, you can see all the uh, characteristics of the glycol versus the polypropylene. Uh, there's a type of antifreeze out there that's RV antifreeze. Um, Ward has it. It doesn't get to the as deep of a freezing point as it says it's going to. You want to get something that's going to, uh, you know, stand up against uh, the uh, winter precipitation. Area I was pointing towards was biodegradable. Uh, if you pour it in the rocks or something like that, uh, at a, you know, it's going to go away a lot faster than the propylene glycol. Uh, make sure that whatever you're using, and it's good at the start of a winter, if you're going to winterize your particular gauge, is to maybe buy a couple gallons of the ethylene glycol antifreeze and mix it with your water. Keep a spare gallon handy because if you do get a large amount of precipitation in your gauge, then you want to have the capability of being able to change that out without having to maybe make a trip to town or something like that. Or if you've got diluted type antifreeze, uh, then you lose the viscosity and the permeability to, you know, have a good antifreeze that's going to melt the precipitation as it occurs. So, any questions? Okay. How to dispose of our old antifreeze? Well, we show Rover and, and Kitty Cat here. Uh, dispose of the old antifreeze where we cannot find it. The sweetness of the antifreeze, and I read a story about this. That's why I put this slide up there. Plus, the dog's cute, and so is the cat. And there's nice spring flowers around. And uh, as we talk about winterization, them spring flowers are going to go away. But keep it out of the reach of animals children as well uh, with the sweet sweetness of antifreeze. Uh, read an awful lot about pets uh, drinking it and it can be very toxic and very fatal to them so let's dispose of it properly. Uh, if you have to, uh, as you use antifreeze, a lot of times what I recommend and, and what we've done at our site is if you empty one gallon of antifreeze after you've emptied that gallon, then take your transfer pump and dump it into a used bucket uh, that you have clearly marked that will not make it back onto the uh, into the system in our bucket system and decant that antifreeze back into the uh, bottle that you initially used when it was brand new, uh, cap it, mark used on it, and dispose of it properly. Are there any questions? Is everybody ready for winter? I'm not. I'll give you a moment to see if there are any questions. I covered a lot of information. I may have missed some things. Uh, if for any reason I did miss anything uh, that you want to ask me later, you'll see the phone number up on top, 1-800-952-7353. Our email is ntn at iswf.illinois.edu. And Brian, can we go back to the first slide of the presentation, please? I made mention when we started this, if this is the first chance that you've had an opportunity to watch our webinar series, uh, we do it uh, quarterly, uh, go.illinois.edu forward slash NADP training. Uh, if you want to watch one of the past webinars or the webinar that we did today, uh, if you click on this, it'll bring up all the webinars that we've done so far. And they can download everything that you want. Uh, to view uh, with our past webinars, we've put a lot of shortcuts for downloading instructional material for whatever we're talking about. And uh, so kind of keep a library. Uh, if you refer to this kind of thing, uh, it might save you some uh, questions in trying to contact Cal, although we are always welcome and I look forward to talking to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're calling, there's an opportunity that you probably, or there's a chance that you've got problems, and we'd rather hear the good news than the bad. Any questions? Well, I would like to say for my engineer, Brian Kirshner, on behalf of Chris Lehman, the director of the Central Analytical Laboratory, as well as the program director, David Gay, we thank you for our your time in joining us 
for today's webinar entitled Site Winterization. And once again, if you have any questions or comments, do not hesitate to give us a call. Thank you on behalf of all of us and have a nice, safe winterization period.